Good morning, everyone. If I can have your attention. Good morning. Good morning and, uh, and welcome to day three of the seventh International Conference on Climate Change. Uh, I know it's just been a fantastic uh, first two days and it's going to be a great, uh, I guess, half day today until 2.30. Um, it's great to see you all here again and hope you're enjoying your breakfast. Um, in a minute, we're going to have our breakfast, in a few minutes, we're going to have our breakfast speaker come up here. Uh, but first, uh, a, an, an announcement. Uh, Jim Johnston, who is a senior fellow at the Harlan Institute and also a member of the Board of Directors, who is standing right there, uh, he's going to be offering, yes. <laughs> Uh, Jim is going to be offering his famous uh, free market walking tour of the Loop of Chicago. Um, if you want to know a lot of stuff you didn't know about Chicago, very many interesting things that you don't get on the boat or on the bus tour or anywhere else, Jim Johnson is the man to follow. And at 2.30 after lunch, he will be uh, standing in the foyer wearing that green hat so it's easy to find. Um, and we'd be happy to escort people around for a nice afternoon of walking. It's supposed to be a beautiful day today. Uh, and learning more about Chicago. So that's coming up after the program is fo over at 2.30. Yes? Oh, that's right. It's, it's just an hour and a half, and so it's not a whole day thing. You won't need to pack a lunch. <laughs> Thank you, Jim. And uh, before we start our regular program, uh, our friends at CFACT, along with myself, actually, were out and uh, met the protesters across the street. You've heard a lot about them, as Jim described, described them. Uh, James Taylor, I should say, described them, and I described them. Um, and Chris Moncton was out there as well. Uh, but CFACT had their camera in tow and made a short video that they produced uh, very quickly last night to give you a feel for what was being done, what was being said, and how they were met by some of the people here in this conference. So if we could please roll that video. There we are heading into the Heartland uh, Climate Conference protesters sponsored by Forecast the Facts. They're upset we're here. They're saying that we are lying, and we're going to go talk to them. We're here with Lord Moncton, uh, myself, James Taylor, and James Taylor of Hartland. Oh, James Taylor. Oh, there he is. Hello, everyone. All right, here we go. We offer to take part in your debate, but if you would not like us to, we will of course withdraw. We understand. All right, we're going to invert the rally so we can continue having it. So would, you, would you like to debate or would you like us to withdraw? It's really not. I just want to ask you a question. Like, I want to know why you're here and I want to know what your passion is. Sorry, I can't, can't talk to you. Sir, can I ask you what science it is that we're missing here? The science of Jesus, friend. Jesus Christ told me that science was real. The moon is green cheese. The earth is flat. I believe it really. Please take me. This is a boot on my head. Your political arguments are irrelevant. Remarkably clean and then you're not allowing them access to the free market. Those, those that's what their argument boils down to. People who are engaged in the free market. Get off it! This planet's not for profit! That's bullshit! Get off it! This planet's not for profit! That's bullshit! Get off it! This planet's not for profit! So, I'm an and, and, and I think that's really important because at the end of the day, this isn't just about corporations. This is about people. And it's about, and it's about our response. that. Uh, <laughs> well done, well done, CFACT. I was going to say it takes bravery to be out there, 
uh, with those people on the street, but I, I don't know if bravery is quite the, quite the word. I think maybe uh, just a good sense of humor and a willingness to debate. I think it's a fantastic, oh, and C Factor, stand up, take credit for your video. I, I think it's, it's pretty telling, of, you know, we've all been hearing these uh, presentations and speeches here uh, this week, um, and we are, I've always been willing to debate the other side, even that aspect of the other side, uh, and they are obviously not interested in any debate whatsoever. Uh, they're interested in making spectacle, in pretending there isn't a debate, and I think uh, Chris Moncton and CFACT and all of us who try to engage with these people um, should continue to do so and should be applauded for it because it shows really um, the nature of the debate that's happening right now, and the more times we can show that, the better. And with that, I would like to introduce our breakfast speaker, um, Roger Helmer is a United Kingdom Independence Party member of the European Parliament from the East Midlands. As the UK IP spokesman on industry and energy, Mr. Helmer often blogs about common sense policies on energy and climate change and the folly of the Brussels-driven climate change agenda. That makes me wonder how you have time for much anything else. Mr. Helmer was first elected to the European Parliament in 1999 as a member of the Conservative Party and was subsequently re-elected in 2004 and 2009 before switching over to the United Kingdom Independence Party. And before entering the European Parliament, Mr. Helmer had an extensive business career starting in 1965 with Procter & Gamble, going on to hold senior marketing and general management appointments in a range of companies, including well-known evil multinational corporations. Here to speak with us this morning, it's my, um, my pleasure to introduce Roger Helmer. Thank you very much, Jim. Well, Jim, thank you for that great introduction. It's a huge privilege to be here today at this Heartland Climate Conference. Uh, I've been trying to work out how many Heartland Climate Conferences I've been to. I think this is the third or possibly the fourth. And I'd like to say a big thank you to Heartland for organizing the conference, for making us welcome at it. But I'd also like to thank all of you for making me and my staffer, Francesca Saliano, so welcome here in Chicago. It is great to be here. I have to tell you, I came up onto this platform with a sense of trepidation, thinking back at some of the great speakers we've already had in the last couple of days, especially Lord Moncton with his extraordinary tour de force yesterday lunchtime. He is, he is one tough act to follow. All I can say to you about that, though, is I do not have a Hawaiian birth certificate. I, I do not have any lapel pins, and I'm definitely not running for president. <laughs> there, have been some other, there have been some other really great speakers. I think particularly of Czech President Vaclav Klaus. That man is an absolute star. I've been a big fan of uh, President Klaus ever since I read his wonderful book, Blue Planet in Green Shackles. I was especially impressed that I found he'd, uh, he'd actually cited me in a footnote on page 34, and that made my day. <laughs> but he is the only, the only leader of an EU country, the only head of state of an EU country, uh, who has come out against European integration and the folly of the euro currency, he is the only head of state of a, uh, an EU member state uh, who has come out against the folly of climate alarmism, and I respect him and I salute him for both of those things. Now, he, he may be the only head of state who has taken that view, but of course we do have other statesmen, uh, and I'm thinking particularly of Lord Lawson, Nigel Lawson, uh, who was formerly a British Chancellor of the Exchequer. Uh, and for those of you who may not be too familiar with the British political scene, I should explain that Chancellor of the Exchequer uh, is our quaint terminology for a finance minister. Uh, and he served in a Conservative government uh, under Margaret Thatcher, and he opposed the folly of the European single currency from the beginning. Uh, he has recently been known to say that the European Monetary Union uh, was the worst political decision of the post-war years. Uh, and I think that, is, that uh, statement is being proved before our eyes if you follow the news from Europe. Amen. Now, we're here to talk about climate, 
But I hope you will forgive me uh, if I do touch on this question of the euro currency briefly, because you cannot understand anything that is going on in the European Union except in the context of this extraordinary um, currency disaster that is taking place. And as I was thinking of what I might say to you this morning at breakfast, it did cross my mind that there are extraordinary parallels between climate alarmism and the single currency project. Both are big, overarching concepts. Both have attracted many true believers. Both have been accepted hook, line, and sinker by the mainstream media, by the establishment, by most of the main political parties, and by the politicians. Both have cost a vast amount of money. Both projects, climate change and the single currency, have attracted in their time small groups of dissenters who pointed out the folly uh, of either project. And I am happy and proud to say that I have been amongst the dissenters on both projects. Both of those projects are falling apart before our very eyes. But as they fall apart, of course, the true believers, and especially the people with a financial interest, let's not forget that these projects have attracted vast political and intellectual capital, but they've also attracted vast numbers of rent seekers and hangers on and people whose jobs depend upon these uh, projects. And those people don't want to see them go away. So those people are coming forward and thinking of every possible excuse which might explain what has gone wrong with their project uh, and why the project was really right, it was just the way we handled it. If you take, for example, the euro currency, they will come along and they will blame the banks. They will come along uh, and they will blame governments for getting into too much debt. They will come along and blame families for spending too much and not working hard enough. All these are reasons, they say, why the single currency is in difficulty, and the one thing they do not understand and will not understand is that at the heart of the problem is the contradiction of the single currency itself. Of course it's true that the banks did some rather foolish things, and probably families did some rather foolish things, and governments did some rather foolish things, but you cannot have a credible single currency and a credible uh, policy, a cre credible monetary policy covering uh, 17 diverse and divergent economies and expected to work. Uh, one of our speakers, and I'm sorry to say I forget which one it was, but asked you to contemplate what would happen if you proposed a single currency for the USA, Canada, and Mexico. Uh, and I think that probably makes the point. What has happened, in fact, in the single currency zone, the objective before they launched the single currency was to uh, converge um, inflation rates between the different member states. To do that, they use the mechanism of differential interest rates. If you had a high inflation, you put on a high interest rate, you drove down the inflation rate. They were quite successful. When they launched the single currency, inflation rates had pretty much converged. But of course, the moment they formed their single currency, they had given away the tool that achieved the convergence. And that tool was differential interest rates. They could no longer have differential interest rates in a single currency. And guess what? It's not rocket science. Immediately they started, the inflation rates started, of course, to diverge. And they say that economists tell us that today, after, what, 11 years or so of the single currency, there is a divergence in unit labor costs between Germany on the one hand and Greece on the other hand of between 30 and 40 percent. Well, of course, you can't expect the Greek economy to keep functioning or Greeks to export anything or indeed many people to go on holiday to Greece when you have that vast divergence. Equally, you have a divergence in the balance of trade. Germany's export machine is all geared up and purring like a Mercedes-Benz, and they are piling up huge trade surpluses. Uh, meantime, the southern European, the Club Med countries, exactly the reverse. They're in deep deficit. Unless you find a way of recycling the money, that situation simply cannot be sustained, and that is what is going on. Sometimes, you know, people say to me, they say, well, America has a very successful single currency, and yet it's quite a diver diverse uh, economy. Um, surely it's going to work for Europe. And I'm always delighted when people ask me that question because if they know why a single currency works in America, they know why it's not going to work in Europe. And there are three key reasons. Reason number one, 
is labor mobility. If you're out of work in Pittsburgh, you get on a Greyhound bus and you go to California, well, you probably don't go to California these days, but you certainly go, <laughs> <laughs> you, you certainly go somewhere else where you figure you can get a job. There is less labor mobility within European states than there is in the United States of America, and the labor mobility between European states, for obvious reasons of language and culture and so on, uh, is very low indeed. The second thing is fiscal transfers. To make a single currency work, you need fiscal transfers. In the US, you have welfare programs and Medicare and Medicaid, and you have government procurement and a whole range of programs that have the effect of taking money from richer areas to poorer areas. Uh, and in Europe, we don't have that. Now, the European institutions went out in 1977, for heaven's sake, 35 years ago, and they commissioned a very serious economist report. It's called the McDougall Report. You can find it on the web if you want to have a look. Uh, and the McDougall Report said, yeah, you can have a single currency in Europe. You can make it work. But you will require fiscal transfers of the order of 6 to 8% of European GDP. Now, that's quite a lot of money, 6 to 8% of European GDP. And although we accuse the European institutions of being profligate, the fact is they only disperse about 1% of European GDP, so there is absolutely no way they can start uh, transferring 6 to 8%. They should have known that. They did know that because they had the report in their hands, but they chose to ignore it. They chose to ignore the professional economic advice that they've been given, uh, and that is uh, partly the problem that we see today. So it isn't good enough for Europe or Germany to do a bailout of Greece, nor is it enough to do a second bailout of Greece, nor even a third one, which I dare say will be on the cards pretty soon. They've got to get their heads around the idea that to make the single currency work, they need permanent fiscal transfers for as far ahead as we can see, permanent transfers from the rich countries, which really means Germany, to the poorer countries, which means the Club Med countries. We even have this in the UK. You may not think of the UK as being a currency union, but it is a currency union between England, Wales, Scotland, and Northern Ireland. And we have a formal system uh, called the Barnet Formula under which funds are dispersed from London to Scotland to make it work. There are many people in England who don't think that's a very good idea, but it is the price you pay for making a single currency work. So Mrs. Merkel faces a horrible challenge. Uh, in fact, she faces two horrible challenges, and I'll come around to the second one if I may. She appears to be one of Europe's great statesmen. Is there a feminine form of statesman? I'm not sure. Anyway, one of Europe's great statesmen uh, in control of, of affairs. But she wants two mutually conflicting things. On the one hand, she and Germany are passionately keen to make Europe succeed and the single currency succeed. On the other hand, she knows that German voters will not vote for her again, uh, if she starts giving very large amounts of money uh, to uh, southern Europe. Already the German taxpayer for 20 years has been transferring vast amounts uh, of euros to East Germany as a part of bringing East Germany into, uh, into the German family. Uh, to be told they have to keep doing that for the next 20 or 30 or 40 years to southern Europe is too much. We have in London, we have a London mayor called Boris Johnson. You may have seen him. He's the one with all the... Uh, the thatch of yellow hair and the rather amusing manner. And he is the king of the soundbite. And he recently, he recently declared that he had a policy on cake. He said, yes, he said, I have a policy on cake. I'm pro-eating it and I'm pro-having it. But, <laughs> but unfortunately, in the real world, you cannot have your cake and eat it. And Angela Merkel cannot save the euro and get re-elected. I don't know what the solution of that problem is. I don't know which course she will take. But that is the challenge she faces. Let me turn now to the question of climate. And there, there are some interesting uh, um, comparisons and contrasts here. First of all, the good news. As we have discussed for uh, several times over the last few days, we are winning the argument for hearts and minds. The public no longer believes it. Um, and frankly, I can't even believe the opinion polls that still show significant percentages of people believing in climate change. When I meet people uh, on the train or in the pub uh, or in the regular course of the work that I do, I almost never find anybody who is concerned about global warming as a threat to humanity unless they are on the payroll or unless they are representing a large organization. And even if they represent a large organization, they will say things like, well, of course, you understand what our, what our company line is on this, 
But frankly, he will tell you over a beer, personally, I don't believe it myself at all. I mean, I've heard that many, many times. Even those who say they believe it don't want to pay for it. If you go out on the street and you ask a lot of people and you say, is global warming a problem? Some of them will say yes. And you say, should we do something about it? And they'll say, well, yes. Uh, and you say, well, okay, do you mind spending an extra £2,000 on your next family holiday on the Mediterranean for the airfares or an extra £3,000 on your next SUV? Um, and they say, no, no, it, it's the government's job. The government should pay for it. <laughs> as, as though the government had money that it didn't get uh, from the taxpayer. So the public have got the message. Even the European Commission, who are the true believers of the true believers, have started at least registering concern about the issue of biofuels. Um, those of you who studied the biofuels issue will know that to a large extent they don't save CO2 emissions. They force up food prices and they, they damage the availability of food, especially to put all the arguments you know, I won't, I won't rehearse them. The Commission refused to believe that for a long time. And indeed, I once heard a European commissioner say, well, there may be some issues with biofuels, but if we reverse that aspect of the policy, it calls the whole green policy into question, so we can't do that, uh, which is an interesting approach to policy making, I thought. Um, I think the good news is they are slowly starting to realize that there is a problem. Also, governments across the EU are cutting subsidies uh, to uh, green energy projects, and about time too. Uh, one of the most dramatic cuts was actually made uh, in my country, in the United Kingdom. I must tell you just briefly, you may be surprised to hear this, that I actually have a solar PV system at home. It's on the roof of my wife's stable, uh, stables, and it's a 2.4 kilowatt installation. Um, now, I didn't do this because I've suddenly become uh, committed to the need to save the planet. I did it because of the absurd subsidies. And let me describe these subsidies to, uh, to you. You can, make, you can make a unit of electricity in a proper power station in the UK uh, for about four pence English money. As a householder, I can buy that unit of electricity from the grid for about 12 pence English money. Every unit of electricity I get off the solar PV system on the roof of my wife's stables, I get just about 50 pence for. So I am getting 12 times the cost of producing that the electricity and four times the amount it would cost me to buy it from the grid. I would be mad to refuse. So I put that in place. Oh, and by the way, that is guaranteed for 25 years. It is inflation protected and it's tax free. How is that for a deal? Don't buy an annuity, put in a solar powered system. I really, I really don't want you to run away with the idea that I am a closet green. So, so just to establish my credentials, I will tell you that I have recently purchased a Jaguar sports car. <laughs> okay, okay, I'm having my midlife crisis a bit late. Um, but it's got a, it's got a five litre V8 engine. Um, I, that's quite big for Europe. I know by American standards, I think it's what, in, in American, it's about 310 cubic inches, so it ain't that big. But, but by European standards, it's big. And I tell you what else, it delivers better gas mileage than Congressman Jim Sensenbrenner's Cadillac he was telling us, he was telling us about yesterday. <laughs> I was trying to analyze the good news on the, uh, on the climate front. We've had some major converts. Uh, in England, you may not know the name, but everybody who reads the Guardian newspaper will know it. We have a guy called George Monbiot, who has been a leading campaigner uh, on green issues for as long as I can remember, and a leading anti-nuclear campaigner. I wish I could tell you that he's actually been converted to climate skepticism. It isn't quite that good, but he has been converted to nuclear power. And perhaps surprisingly, the reason for his conversion was the Fukushima incident. There we had an old nuclear plant in pretty poor condition, and we had the most extraordinary combination of natural disasters, both a massive tsunami and an earthquake. And actually, all things considered, it was remarkably resilient. 30,000 people died from the tsunami. Um, I believe two or three people died from things falling on their heads in the uh, nuclear power plant. So far, nobody has died of radiation. Now they may do, and that is a great tragedy, but get it in perspective. Compared to the deaths in the coal industry and the hydro industry, uh, it is a very small number indeed. Nuclear power is one of the safest forms of generation we know of. And George Monbiot, life... 
George Monbiot, lifetime Green campaigner, has been converted and supports nuclear power uh, in parentheses because it helps reduce CO2 emissions, but we'll, uh, we'll forget about that bit. <coughs> There's James Lovelock. I won't spend a lot of time on James Lovelock because we've spoken about him in the last couple of days, but absolutely a founding uh, Green guru who has led the movement and inspired the movement for decades, and who, as we know, five years ago was saying that the human race was set to die out, apart from uh, one or two breeding pairs at the poles where it was still cool enough, he has actually seen the light. And that wonderful quote, 20 years ago we knew what the climate was, do was going to do, now we don't. Uh, and that is something that should be inscribed on the hearts of all green campaigners. Um, one other name who may be less familiar to you, frankly, I wasn't familiar with him until just recently when I, uh, when I heard from the Global Warming Policy Exchange in London uh, about him, a chap called Fritz Varenholt, who is, again, a German green and a German socialist, which is interesting, spent his life in green campaigning and later on as a senior executive in renewable energy businesses he, in the last year, has come across to our way of seeing the issue and published a book to say so. And, and this is quite exciting, uh, he is um, actually coming to the European Parliament uh, and we have a seminar organized for June where we're going to hear what Fritz Varenholt has, uh, has to tell us. Uh, and I think that will do a lot of good. One other little hint of good news. Um, our Chancellor of the Exchequer, remember I've explained what a Chancellor of the Exchequer is, our current Chancellor of the Exchequer, George Osborne, in his budget speech, made a wonderful statement. He said, you don't save the planet by destroying the economy. And that is a brilliant line. Now, I wish that was the policy of our British coalition government. It certainly isn't. But I'm taking encouragement from the fact that the Chancellor uh, has at least had the courage to say that out loud. That was the good news. The bad news is, of course, that the European Union, the European institutions, the European Commission remain absolutely committed true believers and regardless of whether we believe it or not, the policies they have put in place are there and have not been changed and will be extremely difficult to change. Their absurd 2020-20 policy, which requires a 20% reduction in greenhouse gas emissions by 2020, is doing vast economic damage. Uh, I'll come to that in a little more detail in a moment, if I may. Um, their large combustion plant directive, we are having to close down perfectly viable, perfectly workable coal-fired power stations in the UK that have years of life left in them for no other reason than we have been told to by Brussels. And that is a challenge to energy security and a challenge to national independence, I tell you. We are also in the process, uh, oh, sorry, one other point I wanted to make, yes. Um, we heard yesterday a reference to the airline tax which the European Union is seeking to impose on foreign airlines, which is absolutely preposterous. I want to say thank you, America, for standing firm against this damn thing and do not pay a cent on it because <laughs> by resisting it, you are doing yourselves some good, but you're also doing us some good as well, and the European Commission will end up, I believe, with egg on its face. The problem we have in the UK is that under the terms of the European Union's uh, emissions reduction plan, we are required to reduce uh, our, uh, our CO2 emissions by, um, what is it? we're required to get 15% of our energy from renewable sources by 2020. But really, the only practical way of doing that is to do it through electricity generation. So roughly, roughly, we're talking 30% of energy generation, of electricity generation, uh, from renewables by 2020. This is lunacy. They can't be built. Wind farms, it's essentially wind farms, they can't be built that fast. The cost is enormous. We all know about the problems of intermittency. Wind farms will drive up energy costs. They will reduce competitiveness. They will block economic recovery. They will destroy jobs and they will drive households and families and pensioners into fuel poverty. That, that is the not-so-bad bit. It gets worse. <laughs> because they don't seem to understand that the wind is intermittent. We have in England a guy who is a, a minister for energy and uh, climate change. Believe it or not, a minister for energy and climate change. Um, we had a chap called Chris Hoon. Um, Chris Hoon ran into um, uh, a rather sordid little scandal relating to his ex-wife. Uh, we will draw the veil of charity uh, across the details. Um, we shouldn't intrude, perhaps, on private grief, but nonetheless, 
uh, he had to resign. Uh, he was a Liberal Democrat, by the way. He's a former MEP. Um, and he's been replaced by a chap called Ed Davey, who we hope might be an improvement, but is just about as bad. Ed Davey said, we need wind farms to ensure energy security and continuity of supply. <laughs> How can a man that ignorant, that ignorant of the basic facts of ed electricity generation get into that sort of position? It, it is just heartbreaking to see our energy future in the hands of such a man. We know that if you are going to build wind farms, you have to build conventional backup because sometimes the wind doesn't blow. I don't need to explain that to this audience. But think about what that means. It means you're going to build a gigawatt of wind over here. You've got to build a gigawatt of gas over there. And you've got to run them intermittently, balancing out the wind. So what have you done? You have paid the capital cost of that energy generation twice. And you can bet when they work out the cost of delivering uh, free wind energy, as they love to call it, they'll give you a figure for how much it costs. They won't have built in the capital costs of the backup or the running costs of the backup. And of course, as we know, if you run that backup, it's typically gas, you run it intermittently to balance wind, you run it inefficiently. All these things run more efficiently if you run them continuously. And the fact is that every unit of electricity coming from those backup gas-fired power generators is A, going to cost more than if they were run properly, and B, going to create more emissions. And I have seen at least two studies from different European countries recently indicating that the combination of wind plus gas backup results in virtually zero emissions savings. So we are desecrating the countryside. We are wasting huge amounts of money. Uh, we are impoverishing our children. We are choosing poverty over prosperity. And after all that, we're not even achieving what we set out to achieve. This is madness, madness writ large. It is just extraordinary. And let me put a question to you. If you are being told that you have to build wind, but you have to build gas back up to balance the wind, why not just build the gas and not bother with the wind? <laughs> Especially when we've just realized that we're all sitting on more shale gas than we can shake a stick at. So that's where, that's where we are. There are some positive signs. Um, recently, my former colleague, Chris Heaton-Harris, who for 10 years was an MEP working with me in Brussels and is now a member of the Westminster Parliament, he organized a letter to the Prime Minister from 100 plus Westminster MPs calling on the government to reconsider its wind policy. He got a pretty shabby answer, but he raised the profile of the issue and it got a lot of media coverage. So the fight back is going on. The problem, of course, for Europe is that we are in the business in Europe of giving ourselves the most expensive electricity in the world. <coughs> I hope very much that America will sort out its EPA problem. I'm sure you will, because I don't believe that the American people and American industry and the American economy will stand for this folly much longer. Let's, ass let's assume you do. Let's assume you do. We're going to have Europe with the most expensive energy in the world, largely coming from wind and funny places like that. We're going to have America looking forward to a new industrial renaissance based on low-cost, efficient, uh, in indigenous fossil fuels. We're going to have China and India relying on low-cost coal-fired power, and the result is going to be that Europe is simply pricing itself out of markets. There are stirrings of revolt. Angela Merkel has recently fired uh, her... Uh, environment Minister. I wrote down his name because it's fairly unpronounceable. I'm sure I've got it here somewhere. Yes, Norbert Rutgen has been fired. Now, part of the reason for that was apparently he was involved in some rather bad uh, election results in, in one of the German lander. But the take on this from the Global Warming Policy Foundation in London is interesting and I think it's probably right. Politicians like Angela Merkel occasionally need to kidnap an issue and try and put it under wraps. The technique is you make a very bold statement about how you're going to green the German economy and everybody thinks that's okay and you get away with it and you point, you point somebody and say, take this policy and go away and don't work on it too hard. Well, unfortunately, unfortunately, this guy Norbert Rutgen actually thought he had to do what he'd been told to do and what he'd been announced as doing uh, and he was doing it a bit too well and a bit too quickly. Germany had, one of, as you would expect, one of the most reliable and well-run electricity supply systems in the world, because that's the way the Germans do things, and well done them. They now have a very dodgy system, highly dependent on wind. And somebody described it, in fact, it was Benny Pizer, who many of you will know at the Global Warming Policy Foundation. 
He said the problem for Norbert Rutgen was he had a policy which was possible to enunciate politically, but was impossible to deliver technically. Uh, and I think that was the problem. And he's been moved to one side, and Peter Altmaier, of whom I know nothing, has been appointed in his place, but I bet his brief is to hurry slowly. <clears throat> ah. So these, these developments are taking place. Germany, of course, this is the other tough choice that, that Mrs. Merkel has. She has agreed, uh, in the aftermath of the Fukushima incident, she has, uh, with extraordinary folly, agreed to close down Germany's uh, nuclear fleet. That has created a problem for us in the UK because some of the uh, nuclear, power, uh, nuclear uh, constructors who we were relying on to put in nuclear power have suddenly got bigger worries on their hands in Germany and are less enthusiastic about investing in the UK. But there we are. Uh, she is facing this problem now. Again, it's a have your cake and eat it. Either she can have a secure energy supply or she can pander to the Greens and close the nuclear uh, power plants. My guess is that she will finally be forced to keep the nuclear power plants open uh, and pray God that she will. But that is another really serious dilemma that she is facing. Right, in conclusion, and I see the, uh, the, the three-minute and four-minute uh, cards being prepared over here. <laughs> Now, I did just want, I, I did just want to say um, uh, a, a, a brief personal statement, if I may. Jim, in his introduction, mentioned that uh, I was formerly a member of the British Conservative Party. Uh, indeed, I've been a member of the Conservative Party on and off, I think, for about 40 years, since shortly after I left university. And I had been a Conservative member of the European Parliament uh, for about 12 years. I had been deeply unhappy with the Conservative Party policy on Europe, and for all those years we've been saying it's best to work from inside, we're going to influence the party, we're going to move it in our direction. Um, and indeed I've had people writing to me since saying you should have stayed and fought. Well, after 12 years, when we're all going in the wrong direction and not making any progress, how long do you go on staying and fighting a losing battle? But the other real killer uh, was, of course, the climate issue. I started out, uh, made my debut on the climate issue in uh, 2007 um, in uh, Brussels when I did uh, a seminar there and Lord Lawson was there and Benny Pizer was there and I've been working on that ever since. And of course my views within the Conservative Party, our views within the Conservative Party are absolutely anathema. They do not want to hear those views, they do not want to be told they're wrong. Uh, and I draw a distinction here between the party and the membership. So many of the party members actually agree with me uh, on Europe and agree with us on climate. Uh, indeed, that was why they selected me as their number one candidate in 1999 and 2004 and 2009. So you have this bizarre mismatch between the party members uh, who are extremely sound uh, on these issues, many of them, not all of them, of course, but many of them, uh, and they simply can't understand why the leadership takes the position that it does. Um, but we have the situation where uh, our Conservative Prime Minister, uh, David Cameron, is currently going around Europe and urging them to undertake deeper fiscal integration in order to save the euro. Well, when you've got a problem, you don't actually go around trying to, to uh, save the problem. Uh, you know, if, if, <laughs> if, if you go to your doctor with a disease, you don't expect the doctor to say, this is great, we can, we can save the disease for you. You expect the doctor to say, no, there's a way of getting rid of the disease. <coughs> and uh, if I were still a member of the Conservative Party, I would be deeply embarrassed uh, at what Cameron is now doing. The other thing, of course, is on climate. And again, not all his, mem not all his MPs agree, uh, and certainly not all Conservative Party members agree, but he is absolutely wedded to the alarmist position. Um, you may or may not be aware that um, his very charming wife, Samantha has a father who is a, an aristocrat and a landowner. Um, and I'm not sure I've got the number right, but I think he's making about a million pounds a year in subsidies on wind turbines on his land. Um, I wouldn't suggest for a moment, of course, that uh, our Prime Minister is remotely influenced by that. Uh, I just think it's an interesting thing to remark on, isn't it? <laughs> but the other point I would make, it illustrates a broader problem. Um, something we, I don't think anybody is, I haven't heard anybody mention so far, but this whole green energy policy is profoundly regressive. It takes money away from households and pensioners who can't afford it, and it gives that money 
to rich corporations and rich landowners who could well do without it. Now, I'm not against the rich succeeding, but the idea of plundering the poor and putting the money in the pockets of the rich doesn't sit very well and doesn't look very good in a manifesto. And I want to tell you the contrast that I perceived on moving. I should just add one little point here, by the way, a little bit of self-justification. We all do it now and again, don't we? I've always said that if anybody wants to change parties and they're a member of parliament, they should quit and let the next guy in. I sincerely tried to quit and let the next guy in. And I won't go into the detail because it's a bit complicated and messy, but we ended up with a big dispute with the Conservative Party chairman, Baroness Saida Vasi. There is a standard uh, succession procedure for members of the European Parliament who leave mid-term. It goes back to the list that was used at the previous election. Uh, that's happened routinely in every case that we've been able to identify. Um, Baroness Vasi decided she didn't like that. She didn't like the next guy on the list, who I know and is a good guy. Uh, and frankly, I was prepared to stand aside for, for the next guy on the list. His name was Rupert Matthews, but I was sure as hell not going to stand aside for some hand-picked warmest from central office. So I thought, the hell with it, I shall stay on. But on the second day, the second day with the United Kingdom Independence Party, we call it UKIP for short, by the way, um, I was uh, speaking to our leader, Nigel Farage. You may have heard the name. You may have seen him in the odd video clip. Uh, and he asked me if I would become the party spokesman on industry and energy. And I just thought the contrast, going from a party where my views, our views on climate and energy were an embarrassment to a party where I was actually asked uh, to become the spokesman. So if you want to know what our policy is on energy, just ask me, because I seem to be it. Um, <laughs> uh, I am so happy to be in that situation. Um, Francesca and I are currently working with other colleagues on a booklet setting out the party's position uh, on these issues, and um, uh, we're enjoying doing that too. What I intend to do as the spokesman for the party, and um, bear in mind that UKIP is the only, uh, UK, only major UK party um, that is committed to a rational view on climate and energy, uh, and by the way is currently running third in the opinion polls, Labour, Conservative, UKIP, Liberal Democrats. Bear in mind we have a Liberal Democrat energy minister. I'm going to keep fighting the good fight in Brussels and in Britain and raising the profile of this issue and warning of all the dangers that we are all aware of. But I tell you, in that fight, I am hugely encouraged by knowing that Heartland is here and that you are all here and that you are all engaged in the same battle. <laughs> this is a battle that we must win. We must win it for America. We must win it for Europe. We must win it for our children and our grandchildren, and we must win it for all mankind. And I tell you why we will win it, because we have two weapons in our armory that the bad guys don't have. The first weapon is the truth, and the second weapon is the climate. Thank you. <laughs>
Uh, I said, well, what's the problem? They said, well, we're prepared to talk to elected uh, members of parliament, but we're not prepared to talk to political activists. And I said, well, I'm a political activist. And they said, yeah, but you're an elected member of parliament. And we had a huge ding dong. Um, and eventually it turned out that uh, Christopher Monckton had been in Japan, was on his way to America, and had changed his, his you say schedule in America, don't you? Changed his schedule um, in order to be at this event. And I went back to them and said, look, we got this guy flying from Japan to America via UK in order to come and see you to this thing you said he could come to. And do you know what compromise they offered in the end? They said, well, you come first, we'll have three quarters of an hour and we'll eat half the sandwiches. And then he can come in and he'll have another three quarters of an hour and he can eat the other half of the sandwiches. <laughs> but that's what we did. They wouldn't see us together. But I sat with them and it was just a complete stone wall. Um, no, well, you're wrong. You know, you've seen all these reports. Everybody's looked at it and uh, the misunderstanding and the words didn't mean what they appeared to mean and so on. And the point they kept coming back to, one of those reports, I forget which one it was, uh, was about an inch and a half thick. And the vice chancellor of the university kept coming back to me and saying, but have you read this report? And I was saying, no, I haven't read this report and I'm certainly not going to read the report, but I have read the emails. <laughs> um, uh, no, it was, it was a complete whitewash. We are not going to accept any criticism. We are not going to change anything. Um, and we're going to reject all these uh, comments that are being made and the attacks that are being made, I'm afraid. Tom Drake from Indiana. Have the conservatives uh, in Britain received any apologies uh, for the abuse they took for opposing uh, the UK joining uh, the, uh, the Eurozone? They have not. Uh, and I have to say that those of us, those of us who have opposed Euro membership right from the beginning, um, I include myself, and I include especially Lord Lawson, whom I've referred to already, but of course many more people and, and people in the press as well, um, we attracted a huge amount of criticism and ridicule. We were little Englanders, we were nostalgic for empire, uh, we didn't understand economics, we didn't understand the wave of the future, we were irrelevant and marginalized. Um, and meantime, the great project marched on. This is how these big projects take over and take over the mind of the media and the establishment. Um, and as I said in my remarks, they are coming out now with all sorts of excuses. You know, it's a bit like uh, if you take climate change, why isn't it warming? Oh, well, maybe there are some aerosols, or maybe it's El Nino, or maybe there was a volcano, or, you know, the warming's going on, it's just it's not showing up because there are extraneous reasons, and they will not engage with the idea that perhaps there isn't any warming going on. And it, it's just like that on the, on the Euro project. Um, they will think of all sorts of excuses as, as to why it may not be performing as well as they would have liked it to, um, but it's mainly human failings along the way, nothing wrong with the, with the principle. In fact, I wrote a blog, literally only yesterday I think it was, in which I actually said, I just wish that Nick Clegg, our Liberal Democrat Deputy Prime Minister, who funnily enough was an MEP during my first term and for the same re uh, region, so I knew him reasonably well, always been a passionate supporter of European integration and the European single currency, I just wish he would have the, the good grace to come out and say, okay, guys, for once, I'll admit I was wrong, but they won't. Uh, I, hate <clears throat> I have a small contradiction to something that you said, and it's an unfortunate one. Uh, you remarked that uh, you can't build uh, uh, wind turbines nearly fast enough to achieve those goals that, uh, that are set in England. I I'm afraid they probably can. I mean, we're littering the countryside with them in the U.S., and it's just yeah. bad. No, I, I haven't got the, the figures with me because I wasn't anticipating the question, but they want to put most of those wind uh, turbines, I mean, we ha seem to have an awful lot onshore. Most of them are going offshore, and you can actually look at the kind of very large vessels you need to plant those things offshore and the availability of them and the number of days in the year in which the weather is sufficiently benign to get out there in the North Sea and plant them in that very harsh and corrosive environment where they might last 18 months if you're lucky. Um, and uh, as I say, I don't have the analysis, but looking at the number that are going offshore and the availability of facilities to put them offshore, um, the assessment is that we probably can't do them in the time. Hi, the next question comes from our online audience. It's from John. His question is, there is a great concern with the IPCC making their work not subject to transparency and public scrutiny. What can be done to address the secrecy surrounding the IPCC? Ah, I wish I knew the answer to that $64,000 question. Uh, I mean, I think what we are doing by highlighting the things that are wrong are causing great embarrassment to the IPCC. 
Um, I thought at one time that uh, Dr. Pachari might actually resign. I'm very sad uh, that he didn't. But I think that uh, especially the work of all the uh, climate skeptic websites, what's up with that, Climate Depot, all these guys, because they now know that if they bring out a false statement or a statement that they can't justify, it's going to be trashed uh, in a matter of 36 hours, um, I think we are getting a better handle on it. Um, but frankly, I just think the IPCC, I think we all would agree, the IPCC is just not an appropriate body to do this work. The approach it's taking is not a scientific approach. I wish I had a simple answer for closing it down. Unfortunately, I don't. But I think the work we're all doing together uh, is making the situation a lot better. Uh, Roger, uh, several of us uh, are going down in the room here are going down to the Earth Summit, at, and we're looking forward to uh, the lack of progress in saving the world there. Uh, but we were disappointed to hear that the European Commission apparently is only sending one person, and the European Parliament isn't sending anyone. And I'm wondering if you could comment on that, because the official reason given was that it's too expensive. Now, I know what your travel budgets are. I know how much money you, the European Parliament's Parliament spends on travel, and that's uh, completely incredible. Uh, well, uh, I think that the, the European Parliament, the European institutions do get an awful lot of criticism. Uh, and if we do as we did before, which is to send sort of 30 members of the European Parliament and 40 staffers to Cancun, um, then the Daily Mail will have a hell of a time with that. So there, there is a, an element of protecting the institution from adverse criticism. But I think the heart of it is everybody recognizes that that process is dead. It's not going anywhere. No sensible agreement can be reached. No sensible decisions are made. Um, not even by their terms are sensible decisions made, and certainly by our terms no sensible decisions are made. Um, I would like to believe that it is a sign um, that the world's political establishment is slowly waking up to the fact that this process is dead. Okay, we got another question back here from our live stream. This is from Paul, who is both a EU and US citizen. He asks, it seems to me that carbon taxes are merely a tax to boast EU's general funds and ensure the lavish lifestyle of EU bureaucrats in Brussels. Where do you, all these carbon tax euros go and what progress has been made on the corruption associated with the carbon trading programs? Ah, well there is a big question. What program, progress has been made? The answer is not much. Um, one point I was going to cover in my remarks, and somehow my eye slipped by the note, was the emissions trading scheme. Uh, and by the way, everyone, uh, well done for getting rid of uh, cap and trade, as you seem to have done. Pity the EPA is now doing equally damaging things, but there we are. Um, the European uh, institutions are constantly seeking to address uh, the accounting issues. But nonetheless, the accounts of the European, uh, the European Union have not been signed off by the auditors for I lose count. I think it's about 15 years now. Uh, I don't think they're doing any better uh, on their emissions trading scheme. Uh, of course, the emissions trading scheme is not delivering uh, what was anticipated. In particular, it is not delivering reductions in emissions. The recession has been much better at doing that. Um, but... Uh, what it has done is to pile a layer of bureaucracy and cost uh, onto businesses to create a vast new army of rent seekers and lobbyists. Um, so it's really a very traditional European approach to increase the bureaucracy, increase the cost, uh, not achieve the result. Um, I personally think that the emissions trading scheme should be closed down as soon as possible. Um, I think if you believe that emissions are a bad thing and you want to disincentivize them, uh, then a, carbon tax will, a straight carbon tax would be a better mechanism than the failed emissions trading scheme. But of course, I don't particularly want to control emissions and I don't want to tax energy. Hi, I'm Roy Eppen. I'm, I come from Canada, and I think your Prime Minister, uh, who's a Tory like my Prime Minister, should learn from us because we've left Kyoto. Um, the, the problem I, I have with the European Union now is with, uh, they're, they're now trying to ban imports of our, our, our oil sands oil because of uh, various uh, carbon uh, issues. Um, I think that decision is being put off, but what can be done to, to stop this sort of craziness? And I think the UK should remember that its real allies are across the Atlantic. Well, I, I just agree with, with I think, about 101% of what you just said. 
Um, the European Union is absolutely lunatic to try and impose its own environmental obsessions on other countries, whether through airline taxes or through prohibiting uh, shale oil or whatever it happens to be uh, in this case. That is preposterous. Um, and I think the British government ought to do what you say, but unfortunately it won't because it's wedded to climate alarmism. Um, I particularly think that you are absolutely right when you say, remember, that, that our, our friends and our historical links are um, particularly across the Atlantic, but also more generally with the Anglosphere. What we have done in Britain is we have chosen to link our future um, preferentially to the one economic area of the world which is in long-term relative decline. That's not a skeptical opinion, that's the opinion of the OECD uh, and the United Nations and actually the European Commission itself. Everybody agrees that in terms of share of global trade, share of global GDP, the European Union is conspicuously in decline. America is over the long term broadly holding share um, and the Asian countries and the BRICS are increasing. So why on earth do we commit ourselves primarily or preferentially to the one area that's going down? Why don't we exploit the links that we've established over many years, links of culture, tradition, language, um, in many cases, common accounting systems, common legal systems, um, we would do so much better in the export of goods and even more so in the export of services if we were focused more to the world, less to Europe. One of the ironies is that people like me who are Eurosceptics are accused of being little Englanders. And my reply is, I'm not a little Englander, I'm a greater worlder. I believe in world trade, I believe there's a big world out there and I don't want the attention of our country and our industry to be entirely focused on Europe. Hello, um, I'm Susanna McNeil, a retired investment strategist. Um, in our country, we're fortunate to have a number of alternative sources of information in addition to the blogs. We have talk radio, we have Fox News. Do you have any comparable communications outlets in the UK or in Europe to provide an, another perspective? Relatively little. Um, most of the main media outlets, mainstream media outlets, are both pro-European, broadly speaking, and they just assume the, uh, the uh, climate alarmist position. Um, probably the worst, uh, worst of all uh, is our BBC, um, because the, the left-wingery in the BBC is so deeply ingrained, they don't realize they're being left-wing. They think they're just giving ordinary middle-of-the-road opinions that any sensible and uh, grown-up person would have. And in fact, there is this constant left-wing bias uh, in the media. In fact, Boris Johnson, whom I mentioned earlier, has called for the next uh, Director General of the BBC to be a Tory. Um, but I don't think that's uh, very likely to happen. Um, having said that, we do have some newspapers. Obviously, we have, we have a, a, a blogosphere in, in uh, Britain and in Europe as well. And we have access to American blogs, which is uh, a very good thing. And some of the newspapers are starting to take a sound line, some of the journalists. Um, Christopher Booker, notably in the Sunday Telegraph, has been campaigning on this issue for as long as I can remember. So we do get the message out in some areas, and even on the fringes of the BBC we're starting to nibble. I keep getting invited back onto a show called Radio 5 Live, which is a national, um, a, a national channel. Um, uh, where different opinions seem to be more welcome than they are in the mainstream BBC. So it's a long uphill struggle, but we do have some support out there. Yeah, my name is Stan Littman. I spent uh, 15 years in the uh, nuclear fusion program, and then I, the shingles fell from my eyes, and I realized that was a big government scam, and I got out of that in 95, and I became a trial attorney. And so putting the physics and law together, I really wonder why we're all so timid and we don't go after these people criminally for the fraud they're committing. Uh, I, I, have to, I have to tell you, I love the idea. I'd love to be able to do it. But it's a bit like in the UK, people come to me and they say, why don't we go to court? Because the ministers who've taken us into European integration are in breach of their oaths as privy councillors. You know, and... I, I sympathize with the idea, I would love to do it, but I just know what's going to happen. The courts are going to rule with the establishment, they always do. You're a lawyer, you tell me. If it can be done, I'm sure there'd be uh, uh, quite a head of steam for doing it. Yeah? Well, 
I'm not a lawyer, so I, I, can't, I can't comment on whether it would work. I would love to see it done. Uh, I would love to see it succeed. Just my starting position from having seen various challenges to political positions in court is that they do tend to be dismissed. But um, I'd be happy to be proved wrong. And if you've got a lawyer out there who can prove me wrong, please, uh, please tell me. Is it possible to get scientists down here? Uh, is it possible to get scientists on both sides of the global warming issue, prominent scientists on, say, national TV, BBC, uh, so that the public can actually see that there's uh, what the problems are? Well, I think the problems there are two, with that project are twofold. First of all, as we've said many times during this conference, um, the warmists don't want to come out and engage in public debate. And the problem with, if we were talking the BBC, would be, in fact, that um, the BBC would say, well, the science is settled, there is no debate. I mean, they've, they've virtually said that. They have a legal obligation to provide balance. Um, so again, we say, where is, uh, take the legal point, where is your legal, you know, how are you fulfilling your legal obligation in this case? And they say, well, the science is settled. You know, you wouldn't ask us to provide balance between people who believe the wor world is round and people who believe the world is flat because we know the world is round. And similarly with, uh, with climate alarmism, we know that the alarmist position is right, and therefore there's no point in having serious debates. The one place, again, outside the BBC, but um, you will be familiar with the program, The uh, Great Global Warming Swindle, which was now several years ago on Channel 4. Great, great movie. Um, well worth seeing if anybody here hasn't seen it. Um, and although it's now several years out of date, it still makes the key points. Um, and that caused a, an enormous stir and a, a lot of anger and a couple of court cases following on. Um, but just now and again, we do get something like that, but it is rare and precious when it comes. Uh, what's, the, what's the problem with one currency in Europe? What's the problem with one currency in Europe? Well, I, I, I thought I'd kind of explain that. Um, it's created an economic disaster is the problem. Um, and because the European economies are so extremely diverse, um, a, a single currency always delivers uh, the wrong monetary policy and the wrong interest rate for any particular, um, any particular country at any time. The reason Spain has its appalling problems, it joined the euro, because it joined the euro, it got access to low interest rates comparable to German interest rates. So, of course, suddenly people could borrow money for 3%, not 10%. What did they do? They rushed out and had a building boom. Great while it lasted. If you drive around Spain now, you'll find half-finished building projects on every street corner. And the reason is they had the wrong currency, the wrong monetary policy, and it was a disaster. And you only have to look at the news out of Europe at the moment People are starving in Greece. I mean, it's like a third world country. That is the disaster that the euro has created. Thank you very much indeed. Absolutely, yeah. Uh, I'm sorry, I haven't brought your helmet in. Sorry. Well, quick correction. I don't know whether the capitals matter, but it's... Oh, it does And MEP. Okay, good. Well, that was awkward. <laughs> uh, Roger Helmer, can, you can read more about him. He has his own website, uh, rogerhelmer.com, and you can follow him on Twitter, Roger Helmer, or at Roger Helmer MEP. Uh, so thank you again, Roger. That was a um, very informative and entertaining uh, presentation. Thank you. So it's time for our morning break now. Um, at 10 a.m., there are. this is one of those times where we have concurrent sessions going on. Um, right here in this room, starting at 10 a.m., is a panel on communications with, uh, moderated by Ken Happala, starring uh, Jay Lair, Steve Gorham, and Charles Battig. And upstairs on the third floor in the Williford Room is a, a panel on social and economic factors, moderated by Dennis Avery, and featuring Myron e. Bell, Julian Morris, and Christopher Horner. Uh, thank you all for being here for breakfast, and we'll see you in the sessions.